today, okay? Um, now it is my privilege to introduce to you another of one of our great Mind Out Loud student reps. Um, her name is Helena. She's a junior. This is her first year as a student rep. She's doing an amazing job. Helena, over to you. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Helena. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here. And I get the pleasure of introducing Lake and Tomlinson. So here it goes. Megan Tomlinson is, is a Jamaican-born American football offensive guard for the San Francisco 49ers. He moved to America from Jamaica when he was close to 11 years old. He was raised by his single mother in the Rogers Park area of Chicago, Illinois. He played college football at Duke, where he was named academic All-ACC all four years of his college career. <laughs> Tomlinson was drafted by the Detroit Lions in the first round of his 2015 NFL draft. In 2018, he was selected as the Bob McKittrick Award winner, which is given annually to the 49ers offensive linemen who best represent courage, intensity, and sacrifice. I don't know much about football, but he sounds awesome. <laughs> Helena, thank you so much. Lakin, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, guys. Thank you so much. And that was a fantastic intro. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Helena, thanks so much. Um, love it. And even you're right. It does sound awesome. We're going to get to hear a little bit more about him this afternoon. Um, Lakin, congrats again on that Pro Bowl selection. Uh, very, very smart move uh, by them. And shout out to the Niner gang among us. Um, we have um, offensive lineman Lakin Tomlinson with us, as Helena shared. Um, so why don't we just start here, Lakin? Can you share a little bit more? Helena did mention kind of where you were born um, there in Jamaica, first 10 years of your life. We'd love to hear what that was like and then coming over to Chicago. And why don't we kind of end the chapter, um, you know, graduating high school. We'd love to hear what that was like for you. Welcome to Mind Out Loud. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. And um, yeah, I mean, just a little bit about myself. Uh, mentioned that um, I grew up in Jamaica. Um, you know, my mom is a single mom of four kids. And, um, you know, it wasn't always, it wasn't always tough, but I do remember, you know, having a lot of space in Jamaica. It was, we had a lot of like, just open area to move about as kids. And, you know, although we didn't have much, you know, I mean, we were really poor, but we felt free. And, you know, um, we just didn't have an idea of like what life was outside of that island. And um, my, my grandparents actually moved to the States um, a, a few years before we did, and they worked to get their kids and eventually their kids' kids to the States. So my mom was one of the, um, she was actually the, the last group to come up to the United States back in 2003. And um, so we, we joined her as well. And um, as you can imagine, you know, uh, being a kid growing up in Jamaica, having all that space to moving to Chicago, extremely cold. <laughs> and, um, you know, we were all jam packed in an apartment. Um, I mean, it was it was a real culture shock for me. Um, and, you know, just making that transition, you know, and then just the schooling system as well. Like it was it was very hard, especially for, you know, the, my older brother, you know, he was three years older than me than myself being 11 at the time. And I had a younger sibling who's six and then the youngest was three at the time. It, it made it extremely tough on my mom because she had to continue to work to support us. And, um, you know, we had family help, but I mean, honestly, we were all really struggling. And, you know, um, I owe a lot to my grandparents, you know, doing what they did because they put a bet on, you know, their vision for family. And, you know, I'm sitting here today to tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm here living my grandfather's, you know, legacy because, you know, like I, I, I went on from moving to uh, from Jamaica to Chicago. I went to high school in Chicago, went to Lane Tech, a really big school. And, um, you know, I eventually went on to graduate and I went to Duke and I studied, got two majors at Duke and, you know, I, I got drafted to the Lions. But, um, you know, a lot of people might look at that and be like, wow, man, you know, you have this uh, like American dream lifestyle, but honestly, it, it, it wasn't really like, it wasn't really all that like glamorous. It, I mean, 
like growing up in Chicago, like with the gang violence and you know all the things that we had to we had to we really were learning on the fly because we just didn't know much about the environment. Um, it was it was tough, and um, I w I I went to high school and um, actually my sophomore year of high school, uh, my grandfather ended up passing away. And uh, that was a, a really traumatic experience for me. Um, it, it was it was tough in the whole family, but um, myself in particular, uh, my, my grandfather suffered from stomach ulcers. And, you know, um, my older brother and I, we, my older brother and I, we, uh, you know, we had to experience some tough times with our grandfather. Um, we actually, you know, was there for an episode he had when um, my freshman year, right before my freshman year of high school. And, um, you know, he had a really bad episode and, you know, lost consciousness. He fell and um, hit his head really bad in the bathroom. And, you know, it was shocking. And the crazy thing is, is like at the time we didn't even have like a, a cell phone or a phone at all in the house. And it was just my older brother and I, and I just remember just being so shocked and didn't know what to do. I, I didn't know what came over me. I just, I kind of just ran out of the house and started knocking on neighbors' doors, like begging them to use their phones. And, you know, I called the, the ambulance and they came and they, they got him and, you know, he ended up going to the hospital staying for about four days and he ended up being okay. And, um, but the next year, um, he had a, a trip in Jamaica and a similar thing happened. And, you know, uh, this time he didn't come home from the hospital. And I remember I was still in the States and I remember just thinking back, you know, I was a sophomore kid in, in high school, I was, I was actually very angry because, you know, being there the first time that, seeing what he went through and having him come home and him being happy and to be home. I was, I, I felt glad I was happy. I was there and I was actually angry that I wasn't there one and two that he didn't come home. Like, why didn't he come home? And, um, it actually like really stuck with me. Like that anger went on to my junior, year, um, playing sports. And then, um, he went on to my senior year as well. Um, I used football as a way to kind of just channel my anger and to really a lot of things, channel my anger, stay away from the gang violence. And I really just channeled all my energy into football. And I remember writing a, a senior paper in high school and um, I wrote about the Jamaican healthcare system mm. and how you know, just how insufficient it was when it came to, you know, situations like my grandfather had and, you know, um, the, just the history of the healthcare system and how that trickled down to everything on the island. And, you know, it really stuck with me. And, um, um, you know, I, I took that with me to college and um, I ended up choosing Duke, you know, um, among other choices. And um, because I really wanted to be a doctor and I wanted to give back to the country, I, I really, my ultimate goal I still have today, I wanna to open up a hospital in Jamaica. And um, that's one of the main reasons why I chose Duke because I feel like that would be a, a stepping stone to achieving that goal. And, um, you know, I, I went to Duke and I, I did my major in psychology and, you know, I did my pre-med, but I ended up playing really good ball there as well. And um, I was uh, fortunate enough to um, be drafted in the first round to Detroit Lions in 2015. And, um, you know, like, one of the first things I did as soon as I got drafted, you know, I pulled out a chunk of money that I still can't touch today. I probably will be able to touch in the next like 10, 10 years um, for that hospital in Jamaica. It's something that I'm extremely passionate about. And, you know, it's just been this driving factor in my career. You know, I, I know for a fact that if I can continue to play this game and I do as long as I can, it would only help me achieve this goal. And honestly, if my grandfather was alive today, I, th I think you'd be, I think you'd be really, really proud 
I think you'd be really proud of, you know, everything that I'm trying to do, not only for my family, but for the country as well, because he was a very prideful man and he loved, he loved his family so much. And I'm, I'm just so, I'm really honored to, I'm really, I'm, I'm really blessed to honor him in such a way where I can not only represent, you know, my family, but my country as well. So, um, <laughs> it's a, a little emotional for me, but, um, yeah. that's kind of been my, my, my motivational, that my motivational drive this last, what, 10 years of my life. Right. That there, at so many levels, I'm just very grateful that you get to share your story with us and to know that, um, you know, being an offensive lineman, um, how that is connected to building a hospital in Jamaica to make it so that there can be um, stories that don't have to end the way that your grandfathers did is amazing. It sounds like a, a story of, of service and of humility and uh, really of, of generosity towards others, you know, for the benefit of others. And that's, that is definitely something, um, man, that that's respect, bro. Respect for real. That's why, that's why I play offensive guard, man. <laughs> a lot of our, a lot of our work, we, it goes, uh, goes unnoticed, but I mean, it's for the greater good. Yeah. I, th I think you mentioned before kind of in our, in the in the chat earlier that a lot of times you hear about offensive linemen as when I'll let you finish the line. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times you hear about offensive linemen, you know, it's what, like when we have like a bad play or give up a sack or have like a really bad penalty. But, you know, like, honestly, like 99% of the time we're out there, like doing our jobs and that 1% of the time that's, that's what we get judged on. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. I mean, offensive line, we're definitely underappreciated for sure. And you know, we deserve a lot more praise, man, because we, we really do work really hard. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Just it's uh, it's hard to count the things that that don't happen. Right. And meaning how many sacks did you prevent from happening? Right. Like, let's get that right, stat yeah. line up. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's great. Well, I mean, hey, man. So that's just, you know, just I, I tell all the guys, it's just part of the grind. And, you know, I was fortunate enough, you know, to um, be respected by my peers to uh, make my my first Pro Bowl this past season. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going to keep representing the guys, man, and offensive line. I'm, I'm always pulling for the trenches. That's great. That's great. Well, I, I have a feeling that uh, it's going to be back to back Pro Bowl games for you. We're, we're rooting for you <laughs> uh, for sure. So, hey, real quick, just to take a pause, students, as you're as you're hearing this conversation, know that our uh, question and answer form is live. So hit up our link tree slash mind out loud. I already have a few questions coming in here for Lakin as he shares his story. And I kind of have one maybe to have you continue a bit of your story, Lakin. But um, students, educators, leaders that are out there, hit up the link tree and ask a question here for Lakin. We're going to have the privilege of having him here uh, for, for a little bit more. So um, I hear about just the incredible man that your grandfather was. It sounds like um, that he was someone that had an impact on, on so many even past his life, right? And I think we're looking right now at his legacy and, and that is you and, you know, as a dad and as a husband, you know, which I, from what I've heard and from what I've learned from you just in the short time, that's more than football, right? That's more than what happens when you put the pads on. So we'd love to hear uh, maybe if there's some adults out there that want to be a positive influence on some young folks. Maybe there's a coach out there that wants to be a positive influence. Um, what were the things about your grandfather that made him so influential, that, that made him have such a positive impact on your life? Tell us about some of those things. I mean, honestly, it's all of the work that he did that went on scene. Like, I didn't know that he, even before my, um, my, my parents came in, came up to the States, like he was going back and forth from Jamaica to United States to work. And, you know, he worked the longest time as a security guard. Uh, at um, I think it was Northwestern, um, just up up the road in Chicago, and um, he <laughs> the amount of work that he did just to get and you know my my mother was a uh, was one of the last of ten kids, so you, you can only imagine him working all that time to get every single one of his kids and his kids' kids to the United States, and that was something that I didn't really learn about until I got to college. And I was like, wow, the, this is something that he really like passionately, you know, he cared about us and he really wanted us to have the best opportunity at life because, 
you know, that just wasn't the case in Jamaica. You know, we, 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 he saw that we needed that move as a family, and I'm, I'm so grateful that he did because honestly, I, I, I don't know if I'd be here today, if speaking to you guys today, if he didn't make that move. And I'm forever grateful. My grandma's still alive; she's still in Jamaica. I visit her every summer. But I mean, there's one thing I can, I can say, man, it's just persistence and resilience, man. Like when you have a goal and you have that set goal in your mind don't ever give up and don't let don't let anyone tell you that you can't achieve those goals because you can and you will and all you have to do is just believe oh my that's gosh. all you have to do persistence uh, resilience i hear your work ethic i hear um he was a servant like he served for others you say your mom your mom has nine siblings so you have mom has nine nine siblings yes oh that's a lot of cousins bro <laughs> i know yeah and and every single one of them are in the states either in the states or in canada because so, of grandpa sounds because like because of grandpa grandpa and grandma mm -hmm. oh that's it's awesome. amazing it's, it's very cool it's 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 a it was a true feat man i mean just going back just hearing stories from my mom and because she was one of the last she's the it's the second youngest of the of the my, my uncles and aunts and um so when we came, like everyone was still kind of there, but everyone had their own, had their own like, you know, apartments and stuff. But we were living with like my grandpa and grandma, but we were also there with my, 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 my uncle and his three kids. Mm -hmm. So there was like, I don't know, maybe <laughs> like 12 people jam packed in this small apartment. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was definitely like, it was definitely a major change, but those are just things that we felt like we needed to do just to get to where we, we are today. And we didn't have this vision for this family, but you know, my mom, my mom, man, like my mom is another one, man. Like the amount of hours that she worked is, I think my family is just one for service. Cause my mom, she worked um, like day and night. She was a, a hospice nurse for the longest time that, wow. like for the longest time I can remember. And, you know, it got to a point where essentially my big brother had to essentially like raise us because she was at work all the time. So it, it, it's, it's a lot of sacrifices, a lot of sacrifices, a lot of, you know, privileges that, you know, that I had to give up my, my older brother had to give up just for, to benefit the family. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it all worked out, man. And, and I'm super grateful, you know, for everything that they did and sacrifice. And I mean, I tell them every day, I call my mom every day and, and, and she's, and she's super proud of me because I mean, she's just, she's really proud of the way I represent the family. And I mean, man, she, having me just being an NFL player and then doing the things that I do is like beyond her wildest dream, like of anything that can happen to our family. So mm -hmm. I, I'm just happy I'm able to do something like that for my family. That is great. Well, it sounds like you're, you're uh, following along in grandpa's footsteps on, on doing stuff for others. That's incredible. Uh, so some questions are coming in, if you don't mind. I think it's right in step with this part of our conversation. Um, and th this would be a big one um, here for you if, if you're open to answering it. And as uh, a student says, uh, what might you tell your younger self in high school um, if they've, or what might you tell your younger self in high school that could be helpful for others who may be dealing with the loss of a loved one? I would, I would, I would tell them, you know, it's very hard to reach out to someone, especially when you're grieving. Right. And, you know, it, it might be hard for other people to see that as well, but don't ever shy away from a reaching hand. Right. Um, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to uh, be linked up with a mentor in the high school. And, you know, after, you know, my grandfather passed away, you know, and I was in a tough spot, you know, with just everything in general, but my mentor stepped in in a very crucial time in my life and really kind of just, you know, my grandfather was the father figure of the family, but my, my mentor, he came along and invited me to be a part of his family and really kind of just took that father figure role for me, which was, I'm so grateful for him, but I, just don't, don't ever, don't ever shy away from a reaching hand because mm -hmm. you'll never know how that can impact your life going forward because Bob Sperlin, my mentor, 
he taught me a lot of, you know, a lot of things about being an individual, not just, you know, individual, you know, being born and raised in Jamaica, but being an individual growing up in Chicago um, and just going to, going to school. He had a son who was my age and experiencing two different lifestyles, but we could see like the drive that we had, like just internally. And, you know, he saw that in me and he didn't want, he didn't, he, he believed that, I could, he believed I was a special person and I, I'm so happy he stepped in at a crucial time because like he went, after everything happened to me, I could have went anywhere. Right. Yeah. Like he, kept me on yeah. that, he kept me on that straight path, man. I'm forever grateful for him, man. Wow. I'm really him. So his name was Bob? Uh, Bob Sperling, yes. Yeah, shout out to Bob Sperling. Thanks for your influence. And uh, just know, uh, you know, educator, leader, coach, neighbor, um, uncle, unk, who, whoever's out there, you're having an impact on that young person. And uh, that can make all the difference. I mean, research even shows that like, and like it takes just one consistent supportive adult that can really change the trajectory of someone's life. And so it sounds like Bob did that for you. And, and we're the world and your family is better for it, for sure. Um, so another kind of looking back question, so you go from uh, Jamaica to Chicago, and, and our work with students, um, especially the past two years, we find out there's a lot of transition they've had, um, just from moving or maybe even being without a home for a little bit, um, kind of couch surfing, um, having to live with, with, with family as you did for a time. What advice would you give to those students who are experiencing some of those life transitions they're starting a new school or moving to a new state and not knowing anyone. What would you tell them? It, it, it might be scary at first. And I mean, it was, it was extremely scary for me. I mean, especially with the language barrier that I'm coming from Jamaica, you know, we speak a dialect called Patois there in Jamaica. And I mean, it's a lot different from English, mm. but um, just a language barrier and then learning prop, how to speak prop, proper English. And then like transitioning that from like actually learning like history and stuff like that. It, it, was, it was tough. And then like, obviously like the social environment I was placed in totally different, but my advice would be just go in there with an open mind and try to be as receptive to everything as possible because you, you might not, you might not get it the first day or the second day or the third day, mm -hmm. but if you just continue to go with a positive mind, a positive mindset and just being receptive to everything, I mean, that, that could put you on that trajectory of, you know, just finding some solace and some success. That's great. Appreciate it. Yeah. Shout out to all the students who are kind of in that in between, right? Um, you're, you're not alone. We see you. There are adults, there are others that, that are nearby that, that want to help you and make you feel at home wherever you might be at. Very good. All right, Lakin, let's go kind of present day, have something. We actually didn't get a chance to talk about this, but I'm super curious. Um, looks like someone, someone, uh, a student somewhere out there knows about this. Tell us about hashtag my cause, my cleats. And, <laughs> and were your teammates open to discussing mental health after seeing your cleats? I'd love to hear more about this. Yeah, so my cause, my cleats. Um, so when I got first got traded to uh, San Francisco, um, you know, I always wanted to do my cause, my cleats. And, you know, my wife at the time was actually going to uh, University of Michigan, getting her um, PhD in uh, clinical psychology. So we've always, you know, been a part of like the mental health field. But, but I wanted to make my presence kind of known in, you know, in the league. So I, I talked to her and I talked to some of her cohort friends and I was just like, what would be a way for me to, you know, promote, you know, just, you know, my interest in mental health in the league. And there was like, Hey, there's a fantastic organization, NAMI. Um, and also there's a NAMI Santa Clara. That's like, where are you guys practice? And that would be a fantastic, it's right up your alley. And I, I just got hooked immediately. And I did, did my research and I was like, Oh my God, this is, this is perfect. Mm -hmm. So um, NAMI, NAMI has been, I've been, I've been representing NAMI for the longest time since I think 2018. Yeah. So um, it's, 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 uh, and I will continue to rep represent them as long as I even play this game. That's great. Yeah. Shout out to NAMI for sure. 
National Alliance of Mental Illness. Um, in uh, California specifically, they have NAMI on campus high school clubs. So um, definitely make sure to uh, hit up the Mind Out Loud resources page to learn more about that. If you're in California, talk to your school counselor, some admin there about getting a club. Uh, many of our Mind Out Loud student reps are NAMI club leaders on their campus. So definitely, that, that is great. Appreciate you sharing that. So let's go a little bit more to present day. Um, obviously, we wish um, that you, along with the Niners, just played one more game, right? Just had just one more win. Uh, but you're on the world stage, bro. Like everyone, you know, especially in the age of social media, there's millions watching. Talk to us a little bit about how do you keep some of those worries, some of those fears, some of those anxieties of, oh, I hope I don't blow it. How do you keep those at a healthy level while you're playing at such a high level? I mean, a lot, a lot of um, people might think that, you know, like NFL, you know, it, it, it looks so hard. All these guys are big, strong, fast, you know, all of that. And, and that is true, but a lot, a lot of the game is also the mental part of the game. And not only just like the, obviously being a smart player, but having uh, good mental health and mental wealth. I call it mental wealth because mm -hmm. you need mental wealth to, sustain you know your level of play in this league and um it, that comes into everything like family you know how you deal with your finances you know that anything's happening in the world obviously covid a couple years ago and all those are, are are life stressors that you know us you know as men you know and women in this league you know we have to deal with but you know at the end of the day we still have to you know we have to go play this game that everyone loves but um but that's another thing like I stress to the players in my locker room is that um, the more you can take care of your players, you know, mental health is the better that they will play for you. And I, I had an opportunity to actually really experience that in San Francisco. It was like a healthy locker room creates a, a very healthy work environment. Mm. It allows guys to ex really express themselves, not only like, you know, mentally, but like physically as well. If you're not if you're not so clustered in your head, you know, you can think clearly, you know, when you're talking to a coach and you can think clearly when you're on the field. So um, the mental health part has been uh, really big in the league in the last couple of years. And I'm actually really happy that the, the NFL is, has taken a, a, a big, massive step into creating a, um, a really healthy environment for the players. And that's something I'm really proud of to represent for the NFL. That's awesome. Shout out to the NFL. We will gladly have uh, partnership conversations with you if you're watching uh, to help support what's happening here. Lakin, just one more question. If you get it, we got uh, maybe like 90 seconds or so, but this I feel like could be an important one for a student who maybe is, is watching this uh, by themselves. Uh, maybe they're um, you know, in, in their room or they may not have a room, they're sharing it, they're outside, they're you know, in a, borrowing Wi-Fi from McDonald's or something like that, but this is something they're they're interested in. Um, how would you suggest the students who don't have a mentor, how would you suggest they would find someone that can really speak into their life? Can you, can you share with them before um, we get back to your Saturday? I mean, your mentor could be anybody from an uncle to a teacher at school to even, even one of your friends, you know, a positive role model that you have in your social circle. I mean, you know, someone you can consistent, consistently lean on, you know, not only for, um, you know, any of your worries, but for, for advice about life. So, I mean, they're all around you and all you have to do is just make that one step towards them. man. And it goes back to another thing I say is like, don't ever shy away for that reaching hand because mm -hmm. you'll never know where that hand will pull you in life. Mm -hmm. You, you have been that, that reaching hand for us today, like, and for real, I really appreciate your time. Um, wherever uh, this next week takes you in life, uh, we are for you. We're cheering for you and uh, just really appreciate not only just on the field, that's not, not even secondary, but the, the work you are doing just as a man, as a father, as a husband, as an advocate for mental health, um, we're super grateful, man. Thank you so much again for your time today. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate being on the show, guys. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. We'll see you.